It's a difficult time for all of us. So I'd like to talk about resilience, what it is, who are vulnerable, and how we can enable resilience. So this ability to thrive amidst adversity and bounce back given challenging situations, is it innate or can it be learned? The answer to this, like any human behavior, it is both. There are aspects of resilience that are linked to personality traits. There are some people who are simply optimistic, hardy, or tough because of their DNA. In the past decade, there's growing recognition that resilience can be developed. In fact, the most current perspective is to view resilience from an ecological perspective. We acknowledge that there, while there are individual resources that contribute to resilience, Families, institutions, communities, and societies also provide resources that are key to facilitating resilience. In other words, resilience is contextual. So let's understand resilience from the context of today's pandemic. In May to August this year, we surveyed people to see how they were being affected by the COVID crisis. We asked people what stressors they experienced, and we related this to their well-being. During this period, it was a lack of social support and all the news about COVID that were the strongest predictors. Not surprising, right? This was also followed by the lack of access to basic needs, having increased responsibilities, actually becoming ill, or be just being exposed to COVID. And yes, the loss of income is stressful. So the question is, who are the most vulnerable? It's people who are experiencing these stressors. But beyond stressors, let's also talk about certain vulnerable groups. Earlier, I talked about resilience as both innate as well as a skill that can be developed. In our study, we measured resilience as a personality trait, but we also looked at what we call resilient skills or ways that people positively adapt to crisis situations. We saw that the more resilient the personality is, the lower the stress, the lower the anxiety, the lower the depression, better the well-being. But beyond personality, what people actually did matter. For example, we found that people who accepted the situation, the reality of the situation, people who used meditation, people who used spiritual support, people who problem solved, these were the people who tended to be less stressed, less anxious less depressed, and yes, reported better well-being. Surprisingly, we actually saw a positive relationship between seeking social support, distraction, and positive thinking. People who use this adaptive, supposedly adaptive coping behaviors were actually more stressed, more anxious, more depressed. Of course, the study was not a causal study. So you can't, we can't really say that the behavior was causing the mental health outcomes. It's actually possible that people who are more stressed tended to use these behaviors. But it's also suggesting that some behaviors might be more helpful than others in this situation. Beyond the experience and of stress and how we are coping with it, there are certain vulnerable populations. I'd like you to look at this data. What do you see? Our youth are the least okay. Those who are 16 to 25 appear to be the most stressed, anxious, and depressed. They also report the lowest levels of well-being and resilience. Why are our youth most vulnerable? There are many reasons, but I'd like to focus on three. First, we go back to nature. Adolescence is a time of a lot of physical changes, a lot of emotions. So our teenagers are feeling a lot of things, but unfortunately, brains don't develop until mid-20s. So the ability to cope may be lagging. Another reason is lifestyle. The teenage years are associated with changes in lifestyle. Those of you who have teenagers know they probably don't get enough sleep, they have poor diets, unlikely to exercise because they feel invincible. But we know that sleep, 
healthy gut and exercise are important in influencing mood. Beyond lifestyle, adolescence is a time of identity formation. This is the time where they long to be with their peers. They want intimate relationships. And it's not with their parents. And yet, with the pandemic, they are isolated from the people who they think are most important to them. And yes, we have technology. And technology can open up their worlds in healthy and positive ways. But it can also open them up to cyberbullying or peer comparison which can make them feel more, more vulnerable to depression. Beyond the experience of stressors and age, another vulnerable group today are women. And this is consistent with global data. As you see in the slide, women tend to report higher levels of stress, anxiety, and depression compared to men. Why? One explanation is biology. Genetic and biological factors play a role in the higher prevalence of depression and anxiety disorders among women. Mood swings related to hormonal changes and the reproductive cycle are really just found in women. Another explanation is gender norms. Even when we have a lot of dual career couples, women still share the greater burden for managing families and households as they juggle this with their jobs. Third reason is status and power. Compared to other countries, we, the Filipino women, we actually have more equality. However, even when women have greater literacy than men, we are more likely to be unemployed have lower status jobs, have less incomes, and women tend to be victims of abuse and violence more than men. Knowing who are most vulnerable, the question is, is there something we can do? Absolutely. I'd like to share this mental health and psychosocial support pyramid that describes ways to enable well-being amidst disaster situations. As you see in the pyramid, not everyone will actually need psycho psychosocial or psychological help. But the most basic help that people will need is fulfilling their basic needs. Mahirap maging matatag ang gutom at may sakit. So one very tangible help that communities, our governments, our civil society can do is make sure that right now the people who need help in terms of meeting their basic needs are supported. The second level of the pyramid describes those who might be experiencing mild distress. And as you can see, they can be supported by their families or their communities. The second level of the pyramid describes those who are experiencing mild distress. And they can be supported by what we call paraprofessionals through individual, family, or group interventions. The highest level in the pyramid are those who are experiencing severe distress. And these are the people we need to refer to trained professionals. Now, what can we do? If you are not government, if you are not a community leader, you're a normal citizen. Let's talk about what we can do in our families. Those of you who are parents, are probably worried about your kids, given all the difficulties that they're experiencing, especially online learning. One way that we can support our children is really just to be there for them right now. We need to ask them how they're doing, and we need to listen without judgment. It's also okay to let them know that it's okay if they're not okay, and that they can ask for help. At the same time, it's also important to allow them to experience the challenges and learn how to deal with it themselves. Especially for the older kids, let's not rush to their rescue, nor be helicopter parents. Because failure and hardship is actually important in building resilience. In terms of lifestyle, there's some things we can do. We can help our kids by encouraging to establish healthy routines, making sure that they get regular exercise, sleep, 
good diet. And given how tech dependent our kids are today, it's also important to encourage them to disconnect from their gadgets once in a while and just connect with each other. We can also teach our kids how to manage their emotions, help them maintain their spiritual practices, build their problem-solving skills. And of course, we need to walk our talk and model resilience ourselves. What can our schools and employers do? Many of our local government units or LGUs are already trying to reach out to provide for the basic needs of their constituents. But schools and employers can also do the same by reaching out to their students and employees who need financial, material, or technological support. Another thing we can do is just care for people. In Ateneo, we have the value of cura personalis, which means personal care. With classes going online, students complain about how impersonal learning feels. Employees are feeling the same way. What can we do? We can just ask them and connect with them and ask how they are and what their needs are and what we can do. We also need to be mindful that at this point, people are not 100% okay. So we need to consider this when we give them work or school assignments. They can't be expected to be 100% productive. I've also found that as a teacher, I needed to check in with my students and make adjustments. So whether it's for work or for school, let's be a little bit more flexible because we need to also adjust to people's changes in their lifestyle, in their work arrangements. Finally, both schools and employers can help their students and employees learn about resilience and provide mental health programs and services. I'm also often asked, so where do we access this information on mental health services and programs? And I'd like to share with you a site that was created by the Psychological Association of the Philippines with support from the Ateneo de Manila University. It's called Katatagan Online. And what it does is it contains free resources for self-care. It provides links to providers of mental health services. In this site, we also host resilience classes. Earlier, I showed you the pyramid and talked about interventions that can be provided by paraprofessionals. One such intervention I'd like to share is Katatagan Online, or what we call resilience classes. When you think about resilience classes, you might think, you know, structure, lessons, and to some extent, yes, it is that. Except that what it does is that it teaches resilient skills. It consists of six sessions of about an hour and a half each. And what we do is that we focus on one skill at a time. So for example, in our first session, we focus on kalakasan. What is it that makes us strong? whether that strength is coming from within or other people or our faith. Second session, we focus on katawan. How do we manage our physical reactions? What can we do so that we are not anxious all the time, so that our bodies don't ache with stress? In the third module, we focus on kalooban. When we're stressed, we do a lot of what we call rumination. We think about negative thoughts over and over again. How do we stop that cycle? There are ways. Another session that we teach, or another skill that we teach, is kapakip kinabang gawain. Helpful activities. We try to keep ourselves busy, and that's good. But there are some activities that are more helpful than others. And then we also talk about problem solving. Sometimes, and what I've noticed is that, a lot of Filipinos, we problematize things that we don't have control over or that are, are not our problems. And sometimes the most important thing is to learn how to let go of certain things and which ones I actually can do something about. And that's what we try to teach. And then we also talk about kabulahan. 
a lot of people, their lives have been shaken up because of what's happened. So how do we make meaning of what, what's going on? Is there something we can learn from all of these experiences? And this is what we talk about. We began doing these classes in June this year. And what we did was just to do a quick pre and post test among our pilot participants. And we were happy that in the six week program, participants reported improvements in resilient skills. More importantly, they reported lower levels of depression, anxiety, and stress, and improvements in well being. So I'd like to leave you with that thought that even as these are difficult times, Resilience can be developed. It's okay not to be okay, but there are things we can do to help ourselves. At the same time, reaching out to help others may spell the difference for someone on the verge of giving up. Whether it's in our families, our communities, our schools, or workplace, there are things we can do for others so we can be resilient together. Mm -hmm.